welcome to the 2021 APSA Virtual Meetings Joint Session on Gastroschisis, hosted by the Outcomes Evidence-Based Practice Committee and the Quality and Safety Committee. I'm your moderator, Dr. Stephen Hsu. In complete disclosure, the following session is the culmination of several individuals' hard work. Dr. Mark Seidel and Dr. Joanne Berg will present the systematic review from the Outcomes Committee, and I'll be presenting the quality toolkit material on gastroschisis. Without further ado, here's Dr. Slidell to start us off with the systematic review. I'm Dr. Mark Slidell. I'm pleased to present our systematic review of gastroschisis on behalf of the APSA Outcomes and Evidence-Based Practice Committee. I'd like to highlight the contributions of my co-authors, Dr. Joanne Berg, Dr. Jared McAteer, Dr. Doug Miniati, and Dr. Stig Stone. We'll present our review of the best available literature regarding the management of gastroschisis, and we will provide updated guidelines for the management of gastroschisis. The incidence of gastroschisis has risen over the past several decades. Most fetuses will make it to near term with 90 to 95% overall survival in North America. However, earlier delivery is associated with decreased survival. Across a range of studies, Simple gastroschisis appears to make up 75 to 90% of cases, with the rest being complex gastroschisis. Mortality is very low for simple gastroschisis, but rises significantly in the setting of an infant with complex gastroschisis. Incle increasing complexity of disease is associated with an increased length of stay and higher costs as expected. The Outcomes Committee reviewed the literature and selected the following six questions for this systematic review. These questions were developed by the principal authors and vetted by the whole outcomes committee. The first question is, when a prenatal diagnosis of gastroschisis is made, what evidence exists to guide the timing of delivery and induction of labor? The second question is, what evidence-based recommendations exist regarding antibiotic prophylaxis during the treatment of infants with gastroschisis? The third question is that, regarding the outcomes for different gastroschisis closure strategies. The fourth question is whether standardized protocols facilitate early enteral feeding of gastroschisis patients and improve outcomes. The fifth question is whether any postnatal management strategies demonstrated superiority with respect to outcomes, such as time to closure, need and duration of ventilation, and length of hospital stay. And the final question was whether management strategies are associated with optimal outcomes for complicated gastroschisis. A search of the literature was performed from 1970 to 2019 with 1,300 articles identified. 292 were included in our final qualitative review. Many studies address topics in more than one of our review questions and were reviewed by multiple uh, contributors with a breakdown as follows. I'll address our first question regarding the prenatal diagnosis of gastroschisis and evidence regarding the timing of delivery and induction of labor. This question aims to determine if clear recommendations can be made on this topic. Most consensus guidelines suggest allowing a pregnancy to progress to 38 weeks before birth and that a child may be safely born via spontaneous vaginal delivery. Despite these guidelines, significant practice variation persists in the management of these gastroschisis patients. There's also persistent debate regarding the optimal timing of delivery once a diagnosis of gastroschisis has been made. Those in favor of elective preterm delivery believe it reduces intestinal injury secondary to complications associated with gastroschisis. This, of course, would require earlier induction of labor or a scheduled preterm cesarean section delivery. Arguments against this are that preterm delivery leads to increased complications such as respiratory morbidity, delays in enteral feeding, and increased length of stay. 81 manuscripts were reviewed for this section, and they were further divided uh, into three separate topics. They are the timing of delivery, cesarean section versus vaginal delivery, and the location of that delivery, and the predictive value of prenatal screening with ultrasound. I will not review this final category today, but we will address that in our subsequent upcoming manuscript. Uh, regarding the timing of delivery, there were 28 papers that addressed this topic and two randomized controlled trials. Both of these ended up prematurely uh, being terminated after accruing 21 and 42 patients respectively. 
There were five large national database, uh, national or statewide administrative database reviews, and the rest of the studies were retrospective in nature or multi-center retrospective trials. In order to understand decisions around the timing of delivery, it is helpful to understand the natural history of a pregnancy with gastroschisis without induction of labor or cesarean section. In cases of simple gastroschisis, a fetus is likely to deliver around 36 to 37 weeks, whereas up to 50% of fetuses with complex gastroschisis will present with spontaneous preterm labor much earlier. This raises the question of what is the optimal gestational age for delivery? If an infant is not born by around 37 weeks, should delivery be scheduled? What happens when the pregnancy proceeds to 38 weeks or beyond? And are outcomes different for cesarean section or induction of vaginal delivery? The studies we reviewed showed that delivery at less than, 40, less than 34 weeks has a uniformly worse outcomes. It is less clear for those infants born between 34 weeks and less than 36 weeks. From our review of the literature, it appears the optimal gestational age might be 36 to 37 weeks, with a benefit of decreased mechanical ventilation requirement, decreased need for parenteral nutrition, and decreased time to enteral feeding, as well as a decreased length of hospital stay. With respect to infants who were born at 38 weeks and later, there were mixed results with some concerns for increased infections, although these studies were very limited. With respect to the question of induction of labor in cesarean section versus vaginal delivery and the location of the delivery, there were 22 studies, all were retrospective in nature. We found no significant difference in outcomes for fetuses uh, born via C-section versus spontaneous vaginal delivery. It was interesting to note that there was an increased utilization of cesarean section deliveries in academic medical centers without a clear benefit or harm. With respect to the delivery location, it was noted there was decreased mortality and fewer complications had delivered at a center with a pediatric surgeon available at that center. This appeared to lead to decreased time to enteral feeds and decreased length of stay for inborn infants. In summary, it appears that a goal of delivery at 36 weeks gestational age or more should be considered. For infants progressing to 38 weeks and beyond, Induction of labor or cesarean section should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. For the fetus, there were no significant differences in fetal outcomes for infants born via cesarean section versus spontaneous vaginal delivery, then patient choice should be honored. <clears throat> it's worth noting that the North American Fetal Therapy Network has begun a randomized controlled trial called the GOOD trial. They will compare delivery at 35 to 35 or 35 to 36 weeks compared to expectant management with a goal of delivery at 38 weeks or more. They've just begun accruing patients as of January, 2020, and we look forward to hearing the results of their work in the future. The second question was addressed by uh, one of my co-authors, Dr. Stieg Sohm, and he looked at what evidence-based recommendations exist regarding antibiotic use during the treatment of infants with gastroschisis. This question was further broken down to address three subtopics. One, whether there's a benefit for prophylactic antibiotics at birth and during the time their intestines are in a temporary silo. Two, when an infant undergoes primary closure of a gastroschisis defect, do they benefit from prophylactic antibiotics? And finally, following closure, should erythema or cellulitis be treated with antibiotics? There were very few papers regarding antibiotics in gastroschisis. There was a general recognition of perhaps increased risk of gastrointestinal or respiratory infections, and it was thought that this might possibly do related, uh, be due to abnormal gut microbiome in gastroschisis patients compared to patients who do not have gastroschisis. It was also found that a silo may have an increased risk of infection, but the evidence was not strong for this. When there was an isolated bacterial, Staphylococcus was the most commonly isolated. Many studies favored long-term antibiotic duration without providing significant evidence to support this. In addition, CRP and neutrophil count ratios appear to be unreliable markers of infection in these patients. Our conclusions were that antibiotic prophylaxis should be considered while bile is in the silo, and broad spectrum antibiotics for 24 to 48 hours after closure may be of benefit. When cellulitis occurs after closure, a narrow spectrum cephalosporin may be sufficient based on antibiograms that have been published. 
The third question was prepared by Dr. Jared McAteer and addressed whether outcomes are different for gastroschisis closure strategies, such as primary fascial closure versus delayed closure uh, after time in a silo or sutureless closure. There are only 10 papers directly addressing the timing of repair. The highest quality studies showed some association between early repair and improved outcomes, such as earlier enteral feeding, decreased length of stay, and decreased mechanical ventilation days. However, other patient disease factors appear to have a greater impact than the actual timing of repair. Our recommendation is that early bowel stabilization and fascial closure is prudent when achievable. However, this should not supersede other considerations such as the patient's physiologic stability or the size of the uh, abdominal wall defect. The second part of this question compared a tempic primary closure versus serial silo reductions followed by closure. Most studies were unadjusted and found conflicting results. In the few studies that conducted a multivariate analysis, primary repair was associated with shorter length of stay and decreased time to feed. Our recommendation is a primary repair without stage silo reduction should be attempted when physiologic status and abdominal domain appear to permit this. This may allow for earlier initiation of internal feeds and decreased length of stay. The final part of question number three compared outcomes for sutured versus sutureless closure. There was a single randomized controlled trial and 13 retrospective studies. The majority of studies found no difference in the time to feeding or length of stay and no clear difference in the rate of wound infections between these strategies. The most common finding was that sutureless closure resulted in fewer days of mechanical ventilation and fewer exposure to anesthesia. With respect to long-term outcomes, umbilical hernias were documented in up to 60 to 90% of patients in the early follow-up period after sutureless closure. It does appear that many of these will continue to close spontaneously with an estimated uh, five to 10% that will ultimately require herniorrhaphy later in life. In summary, our uh, recommendation for this final portion of this question is that sutureless closure appears to be safe and effective with similar post-op feeding and length of stay metrics when compared to sutured closure. The institution of standardized protocols may also minimize sedation and intubation and can lead to decreased need for minute ventilation or for uh, uh, days on a ventilator and anesthesia. Now, Dr. Joan Berg is gonna present the findings for our remaining three questions. The fourth question of this standardized review was addressed by Dr. Stieg Som from University of Colorado School of Medicine. The question was, do standard protocols facilitate early feeding in babies with gastroschisis and are outcomes improved? 25 studies were identified that evaluated the question of how feeding impacts outcomes in gastroschisis infants. The majority were retrospective and one randomized controlled trial was identified. Five papers contain standardized protocols. Three of these examine feeding as part of an overall clinical pathway, and in two papers, feeding-specific protocols were evaluated. It is important to note that these protocols generally used breast milk, and they concluded that protocols do promote earlier initiation of feeding and a decreased time on TPN. However, evaluation of these feeding protocols did not demonstrate any consistent improvement in length of stay or infection rates. One randomized controlled trial was found by Curry, published in 2004. This study compared the use of erythromycin in a group of babies with gastroschisis to those that did not have get erythromycin, and no difference in outcomes was identified. Two small retrospective studies also evaluated the use of feeding protocols and the development of neck. These descriptive studies suggested that slow feeding advancements may prevent the development of neck in gastroschisis infants. Overall, for question four, the recommendations from the systematic review were that feeding protocols do appear to decrease the time to initiate enteral feeding and the total number of days on TPN. Breast milk is the optimal feed. Slower feeding advancements in infants with gastroschisis may decrease the incidence of neck, and erythromycin has no role. 
Question five was, have any other postnatal management strategies demonstrated improved outcomes? The outcomes evaluated included a decreased time to close, a decreased need for mechanical ventilation, and a decrease in length of hospital stay. This question was evaluated by Dr. Doug Miniati from Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, Roseville. Nine articles, mostly retrospective studies were evaluated. These studies did often lack controls and it is important to note that they also predated the sutureless closure era. Monitoring was generally instituted to guide defect closure evaluate respiratory status and predict the return of bowel function in order to guide the institution of intestinal feeding. The most feasible monitoring techniques that may provide information to consistently guide outcomes included, first, a bladder pressure under 20 millimeters of mercury. Adherence to this guideline did appear to result in less intestinal necrosis and less oliguric renal failure. Bedside ultrasound was also found to identify the return of complete intestinal motility up to three days earlier than clinical evaluation alone. Therefore, the review found grade four evidence that monitoring can provide some information to guide management and improve outcomes. Specifically, we would recommend the institution of bladder pressure monitoring with a pressure less than 20 millimeters of mercury to guide silo reduction, and ultrasound at the bedside can also evaluate the return of intestinal function, and this may allow an earlier institution of intestinal feeding. Other strategies that were evaluated were the institution of a protocol compared to the institution of a dedicated team. 10 articles were reviewed. These were generally retrospective and included some prospective studies and one survey. By far, the review found that the institution of a standardized protocol resulted in better outcomes than simply the institution of a dedicated team. For example, the four studies on the left here all revealed improved outcomes in the following areas. Decreased length of stay, decreased use of ventilator, decreased sepsis and infection, decreased time to institute feeds. The review recommends the institution of standardized gastroschisis care management protocols to improve outcomes. Other strategies that were evaluated were the question of whether an increased hospital volume improves outcomes. Four studies were found by the review and these, had, these found that increased volume appeared to have no real impact on outcomes. One study by Sachs did show a slight trend to decrease mortality and decrease length of stay. Most of these volume studies were, um, were taken from large administrative databases, which may have more transfers and have inaccurate coding. In addition, the definition of high volume versus low volume was quite variable. Therefore, from this systematic review, no recommendation for minimum volume of patients with gastroschisis can be, can be made. Other strategies that were evaluated were the institution of paralytics and anesthesia. Six papers were evaluated. There were four retrospective reviews and two had standardized protocol analysis. When the, pre -closure, when the use of pre-closure paralysis was evaluated, it was found consistently that infants have a longer time to closure and a greater need for mechanical ventilation. Overall, avoidance of paralytics appears to improve outcomes with decreased ventilator days and improved resource utilization without an effect on length of stay. This systematic review found the avoidance of anesthesia and paralysis in gastroschisis infants is preferred and results in better outcomes. This was level two evidence. In addition, several other strategies were evaluated with descriptive studies and six descriptive studies were looked at. Fluid overloaded infants did appear to have more ventilator days 
Papers that examined a longer duration of narcotic use also reported lower neurodevelopmental scores in early childhood. Gastroschisis infants do show changes in the fecal microbiome and probiotics appear to attenuate this, but the meaning of this will require further study. No specific bowel protection technique could be demonstrated to correlate with better functional outcomes. Therefore, there is descriptive evidence to avoid excessive fluid administration as it may prolong ventilation days and minimize narcotic exposure. However, this, these aspects do require further study and investigation. The final question, question six, was what management strategies are associated with optimal outcomes for complicated gastroschisis infants? And this question was evaluated by myself. 44 studies, the majority were retrospective, were evaluated. A re systematic review of this literature of complex gastroschisis found that a standard definition is promoted throughout the literature. The institution of a standard definition is important because it promotes valid comparisons and will improve quality of further studies. The definition includes bowel complications that are specifically present at birth, such as atresia, volvulus, perforation, or necrosis. Complex gastroschisis would exclude simple gastroschisis patients that later develop neck or other complications. Gastroschisis with atresia occurs between 5 to 25% of cases, 80% of these are jejunal. This systematic review found that early primary anastomosis is preferable if feasible. Putting the intestine in continuity does appear to promote earlier feeding. If the surgeon determines that primary anastomosis is not feasible, then delayed repair can be done, and this can still be a primary anastomosis, or if not, then enterostomy with possible refeeding also may have good results. The clinician must evaluate both the overall infant status as well as the inflammation of the bowel, the location of the atretic segments, their number, and the overall bowel length when making decisions about surgery for complicated gastroschisis infants. The systematic review found that matting of bowel in gastroschisis is not specific for atresia and does not denote atresia necessarily. Many infants with um, complex gastroschisis will develop dilation and dysmotility and the recommended procedure is resection with early tapering enteroplasty. One specific type of complex gastroschisis is the vanishing gastroschisis. There are less than 100 reports available and 11 retrospective studies were reviewed. Vanishing gastroschisis is associated with catastrophic bowel loss. The mechanism is unknown. Despite this, there is much there are many studies that suggest an early jejunal colonic anastomosis still can provide satisfactory results. Bowel length should be documented as in all cases of complex gastroschisis. Perforation is another specific type of complex gastroschisis. However, too few studies exist to evaluate perforation in isolation. There are many isolated reports that early, immediate, primary repair is satisfactory. The systematic review recommends for infants with complex gastroschisis to first evaluate the infant's overall condition and the condition of the intestine and proceed with primary anastomosis if at all feasible. Even in the setting of vanishing gastroschisis with catastrophic bowel loss, a jejunal colonic anastomosis can be quite feasible. Otherwise, stomas with refeeding are a reasonable option. The review found that matting improves with time and is not specific for atresia. If there is no progression of intestinal function, one must consider missed atresia and evaluate the infant with contrast studies. The systematic review recommends the institution of a standard definition for complicated, complicated gastroschisis. And this would include infants born with atresia, necrosis, volvulus, perforation. Again, primary anastomosis is recommended. Perforation can occur in the setting of atresia and we recommend primary repair. For dilation and dysmotility, we recommend early tapering enteroplasty. 
Many infants with complex gastroschisis will require reoperation. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Chu from the Quality and Safety Committee. Thank you, Dr. Berg. So I'm going to present the Quality and Safety uh, Committee's toolkit, specifically on gastroschisis, and on behalf of uh, Dr. Lauren Berman, myself, and the rest of the Quality and Safety Committee. The learning objectives for this part of the session are to demonstrate the accessibility and principles of the QSC toolkit to facilitate implementation of QI endeavors by other institutions, and to review the gastroschisis specific content within the toolkit in alignment with the, obstetric, with the outcome systematic review that you've just heard. So what is the QSC toolkit? It is a culmination of various QI efforts from volunteer contributions by APSA members. It's established in an open content platform with living documents and folders that are continuously updated and augmented by the committee. There are links through APSA website, as well as through pediatric NAT for subscribers. Materials can include project summaries with specific QI guidance, instruction and educational talks, clinical pathways, order sets, templates, flow diagrams, and links to published manuscripts that are relevant, as well as contact information for the local QI content experts involved with those projects. The toolkit is really geared towards assisting development of similar QI projects by others. Well, how do you find it? Well, go to our APSA website, um, is located at the bottom of your screen. If you look at the header portion of the APSA website, you see resources, and then the quality safety toolkit is located there. Moreover, here is a QR code for direct access to the uh, quality and safety toolkit. This will be displayed throughout the remainder of this session. The main phrase, or to me, the main uh, folder, the quality and safety toolkit is demonstrated here. And you can see a variety of different topics that are continuously being updated as well as augmented by the quality and safety committee. Here, the gastroschisis and emphalocele uh, folder is being updated and entered. And you'll see the first page is the master project and content list that lists the various quality uh, improvement projects that have been entered into the uh, folder. As you enter in further, it's a Google Drive that's shared and um, lists by folders all the different QI projects that have been uh, submitted by various institutions. Within the main folder are three files. That includes, again, the master project and content uh, uh, list, contact list, the welcome page for identifying how to view the material, as well as how to submit your own QI project and contribute to the uh, gastroschisis toolkit, as well as a running tabulation of up-to-date various published quality improvement projects that we encourage others to contribute to. The current content includes various sutureless closure instruction and clinical pathways, as well as more comprehensive clinical pathways by various institutions. First from the University of Virginia and uh, espoused by Dr. Jeffrey Gander, are educational in-service tools on sutureless closure, as well as pathway flow diagrams that they've uh, used. More importantly is to demonstrate the readme first file that's included in all of the folders for the various QI projects. These README first files are used to help describe the QI project, the enclosed tools that are in the folder, who is involved as far as stakeholders, as well as the tidbits and lessons learned from the QI implementer uh, locally. There's a PubMed link to the available manuscript, as well as the direct contact information for the implementer for other sites to utilize. Again, another project by Nemours and Dr. Berman herself uh, with regard to uh, implementing sutureless closure at uh, Nemours Institution. Again, there's educational in-service tools as well as well-defined pathways for closure management. Dornbecker Children's Hospital led by Elizabeth Falkowski have demonstrated a detailed comprehensive clinical pathway and I'm not going to go over the various uh, detail within this, but uh, in general, 
The pathway was used to minimize variation fluid resuscitation, PIC and TPN use, as well as when to stop antibiotics and to define removal criteria for oral gastric tubes, as well as when to initiate feeds and how to advance. They demonstrated a high compliance with no change in complications, as well as demonstrated a decreased time to full feeds for their patients. In a similar fashion, Dr. Eric Skarsgård at British Columbia Vancouver also developed a significantly uh, detailed comprehensive clinical pathway, as you can see here. Again, the detail is within the uh, QSC toolkit that you can download. Moreover, there's extensive detailed templated order sets that they created, as well as a quality assurance final check um, that their resident or fellow was to perform after 48 to 72 hours from the procedure. In general, they standardize a delayed bedside sutureless closure technique. They maintain fluid resuscitation and PIC and TPN initiation choices, as well as deciding on antibiotic uh, duration and type based upon a risk stratification. They use their standardized forms, as well as standardized procedure sedation and wound care management. They demonstrate an excellent compliance with no change in complications and demonstrated a decreased time on ventilation with their patients. The University of California Fetal Consortium, which is a compilation of five University of California Children's Hospitals, developed a comprehensive clinical pathway of multiple disciplines involved, including obstetrics, neonatology, and pediatric surgery. Again, here, this was led by Dr. Dan Diawarte at UCLA, and you can see the various information that's available as well as a detailed clinical pathway. What they uh, espoused was a recommendation for vaginal non-preterm delivery by obstetrics, and then rectal and gastric decompression, as well as preferred bedside primary or potentially prompt delayed closure by silo. They had standardized fluid resuscitation, PIC and TPN use, as well as antibiotic type and discontinuation. They recommended minimization of intubation and ventilation, as well as paralysis and opioid use. They also encouraged oral stimulation and then uh, removal criteria for oral gastric tube and initiation for feeding, as well as the type and advancement of the uh, feeding uh, rate. They demonstrated a high compliance across the five uh, UC campuses with no change in complications. They demonstrated a decreased ventilation time, a decreased time for those that had uh, delayed closure by silo, as well as decreased antibiotic days and time to initiation, as well as time to full feeds. In a similar fashion, you'll find that the uh, group at St. Justine and the University of Montreal have also developed a uh, detailed clinical pathway uh, this included a multidisciplinary team that was going to be available at delivery, as well as instituting rectal and gastric decompression, as well as use of bedside primary or prompt delayed closure. They standardized fluid resuscitation, as well as PIC and TPN initiation, and the antibiotic type and when to discontinue. They also recommended minimizing opioid use after post-reduction time and the uh, criteria for removal of, or of the oral gastric tube. They standardized the feeding type, the when to initiate, and the advancement rate. These findings will be presented later during this meeting of APSA 2021 as another uh, uh, presentation. In general, you found common themes that are present throughout these topics of uh, QI initiation by multiple uh, facilities. It included multiple discipline collaboration as well as engagement of stakeholders, evidence-based review of the management to be able to create pathways uh, locally, as well as they assessed their past and current metric outcomes at their institutions. They developed clear clinical pathway management definitions and goals with the goal of minimizing variance in care as well as uh, balancing the countermeasures for complications. They developed educational tools for in-servicing of ancillary staff and residents, as well as they did periodic reassessment and redirection as a standard for QI improvement. As you can see in summary, you've uh, seen an extensive systematic review of gastroschisis by the Outcomes and Evidence-Based Practice Committee, and a manuscript for those findings is going to be forthcoming. 
We've reviewed the Quality and Safety Committee's toolkit regarding various QI projects within gastroschisis, and this is currently active and available through the APSA website and, again, is continuously updated. The goal is to allow facilitation of improvement of overall gastroschisis outcomes globally through evidence-based practice guidelines, as well as development of QI. And we have an appeal to APSA members is to please share and contribute your QI work that we all know you're doing so that other, others can benefit from your uh, hard work. We all would like to thank you from the outcomes and from the Quality and Safety Committee. And a question and answer session will now follow. Well, as we're joining the session again, I'd like to uh, comment that the APSA Green Room was very invigorating. I feel much more alive and feel like those presentations were probably, oh, months ago or so forth. I don't know about the other panelists and how they feel. Uh, there's been a stimulating discussion in our chat and Q&A session to the WOVA uh, website. And so I was going to uh, feed a question over to Mark, uh, which is, uh, basically about the uh, prenatal uh, suspicion of uh, vanishing gastroschisis and how to consider what the outcomes review would suggest when's the timing of uh, delivery for that kind of concern, how often are you evaluating by ultrasound, and when do you pull the trigger and deliver early as opposed to the other uh, recommendations? This is an excellent question, and uh, the brief answer is we don't have a great answer for this yet. One of the problems is uh, still need to define what is good evidence. We have to establish a more standard definition for uh, bowel dilation and closing gastroschisis in order to facilitate comparing outcomes between studies. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the literature on this topic, and we didn't talk about it a lot in this presentation, but we will talk about it in our systematic review paper. Uh, but this is one of the key things that needs to be done, just defining standard definitions for diameter of defect uh, and bowel dilation. Isolated bowel dilation in the absence of fetal distress may or may not really predict outcomes. And uh, a, a really important point is extra abdominal intestinal dilation is more concerning than intra abdominal dilation, as that may be a risk for intrapartum fetal compromise uh, as uh, some of the people in our chat have been pointing out. And Joan, uh, do you mind answering a question uh, that was also placed about the maybe uh, discrepancy between uh, recommendation for potential of uh, bladder uh, pressure monitoring, uh, risk for UTI uh, versus um, uh, further need for that and um, how relevant that is currently with uh, various protocols moving forward and decreasing abdominal pressure and so forth. Yes, uh, Steve, I'm, thank you for the question. Um, well, first of all, we looked at various um, monitoring techniques that were possibly feasible to help us make clinical decisions for patients with uh, gastroschisis during closure. And of the various papers that were available, the paper that papers that looked at bladder pressure monitoring appeared to be some of the better performed papers and possibly more feasible to be done at the bedside. However, um, that being said, that like all treatments, um, the, this monitoring probably should be tailored to the individual patient. And once the clinician looks at the abdominal visceral disproportion, if they if they deem that this baby um, is somewhat more difficult to make decisions and they're taking the entire clinical picture into account, bladder pressure monitoring has been used for 24 hours for short periods of time to help guide the clinician. And it really is an option, um, but it would be part of clinician specific practice and also the results would be taken into account with many other aspects of clinical care, such as vent settings and urine output and, um, and just uh, vital signs. Um, I don't recall that the incidence of urinary tract infection was specifically evaluated, but certainly that's 
a reasonable concern and therefore we present it as just an option tailored to the specific patient and with the um, caveat that this was one of our better better performed papers that we reviewed. Thanks, John. And then, uh, Lauren, I don't know if you um, had much in the way of uh, follow-up or guidance with regard to umbilical hernia occurrence. Uh, it's been asked by Dr. Meenan in the uh, Q&A session. Um, you have a lot of experience with doing uh, sutureless closure, and a big issue or concern that people had was how often are they going to be developing umbilical hernias? Are you just going to operate on them anyways? What is your experience from uh, umbilical hernia management or wound care issues with a sutureless closure? Thanks, Steve. Uh, thank you for really a great review of the toolkit material. Um, so we haven't seen any umbilical hernias that have needed repair, but I really would say our experience pales in comparison to what was presented during the systematic review, which really found the same thing with a five to 10% risk. Um, I think the most challenging thing about sutureless closure is kind of the culture change that it requires in the NICU. Um, it's a, we started doing this about six years ago um, and that's the protocol that we put on the toolkit. And it, it really helped to take a lot of pictures about like what it's supposed to look like. Um, when people are used to, you know, the nice closed umbilicus and now all of a sudden there's kind of a hole with bowel that's visible, it just makes everyone really nervous. Um, oh, and what if the tegaderm falls off in the middle of the night and is the bowel gonna come pouring out? So I think just kind of really engaging the bedside nurses was very important. Um, and I think, you know, that was really more of the challenge than the concern about a long-term umbilical hernia, which really isn't that big of a deal even if it does happen. Uh, and then I just also wanted to make a comment about, so we recently, I mentioned six years ago, we started the sutureless closure, but it was a very abbreviated protocol that only had to do with that immediate management um, postnatally. We have been, since updated and created a much more comprehensive protocol that was led by one of my partners, Matt Bolick. And I will just say that having access to the UCFC, the Vancouver uh, protocols that were in the toolkit made that so much easier. One of the big challenges, again, about culture change was in our NICU, nursing was very used to administering morphine with every silo reduction, you know, with the initial silo placement when the baby was born and then with every reduction. And this was sort of a big conflict between the surgery team and the NICU nursing team. Um, and because we were able to demonstrate like, look, people are doing it with Sweeties and Tylenol and it's fine. Um, we're still working on it, but we're slowly changing that culture. So I just think having the actual stuff that people were using at other hospitals to implement these protocols and sharing that locally and really engaging the bedside nurses um, has led to our early success. Um, so it's been a great resource for us and hopefully others will be able to take advantage of it as well. Perfect. And Mark, um, there was an early discussion at the beginning of our uh, uh, recorded session about the good trial um, in the chat uh, session. And um, your recommendations from the outcomes committee is um, uh, right in between the two randomized arms, meaning 36 to 37 weeks versus in a good trial, it's 35 um, or 38. Um, any thoughts as to uh, how your outcomes uh, review and your recommendations are going to be impacted from the good trial, which uh, we don't know when those results will come out, but what are people to do now, um, yeah. you know, 2021? It's a great question. I think one of the really interesting things I learned doing this project is that the natural history of simple gastroschisis is that infants tend to be born at 36 to 37 weeks. So that tells you a lot. Nature's pretty smart. So I think the good trial is really well designed to figure this out because they're looking at if we deliver before that 36 to 37 weeks, is there a benefit? So I'm really excited to see their results. Um, you know, I think that's going to be great study when that comes out. Uh, and, and one last comment, I'd really like to applaud the work that San Justine group did uh, and presented earlier. It's a great example of uh, the bundles that you guys are talking about and how it can make a huge difference in your, uh, in your practice. Great. And uh, Joanne, there was, there was a question in the chat as well with regard to what should people do with the vanishing bowel that they're coming to deal with? Uh, uh, basically open it up, dunk it into the belly cavity and just leave it be no matter what it looks like or resect, repair. 
uh, so forth. What did your uh, review on the complicated gastroschisis uh, um, give you an answer for, or maybe not? Well, yes, vanishing gastroschisis is always a challenging problem. And there really is not much literature available. But surprisingly, the literature that is there does frequently report that if the surgeon can perform primary anastomosis, it is um, tends to be quite, a, um, quite successful. And of course, many factors probably go into this. So if the bowel is looking that it's going to be feasible, then that might be what's um, promoting the success. And each case would have to be taken individually. Um, some may need a silo for a certain amount of time till the bowel improves. Um, I don't think there's anything specific that says to just put it back into the abdomen. I think a surgeon would want to observe it before, um, before performing that. Great. And Lauren, here's another question from uh, Dr. Chaudhry um, early on, which is, what would you recommend for an institution that has maybe lower uh, uh, means of uh, available resources where they have no silo available? Um, what, should, what should they do? And they can't primarily <laughs> close the abdomen. Yeah, no, I think obviously all of this review and all these recommendations are not based on LMICs. Um, I happen to know uh, Tamara Fitzgerald, a surgeon at Duke, is actually starting to do a trial evaluating the feasibility of using a homemade silo using a female condom and a urinary catchment bag uh, to construct a silo out of low cost materials that might be able to be used in LMICs. Um, so stay tuned for that. But um, I think in general, what I was really impressed with with the Montreal data that was presented earlier today was how much primary closure could be achieved, you know, with immediate attempt, you know, in the delivery room. I was surprised. We certainly have not seen that much of a rate of primary closure. We're able to use sutureless closure even without primary closure because we uh, put the umbilical cord into the baby's abdomen kind of underneath the silo between the silo and the abdominal walls. So we can still preserve it, just fish it out, you know, three or four days later and put it over the defect. Um, and if you don't have the cord, you can use, you know, zero form gauze or something um, non-stick for the surface of the bowel. But, um, but yeah, obviously I think it's your, I, I would think more of a challenge in the LMICs is not having IV nutrition. Um, even if you could fashion a silo, you know, to keep these babies alive until they're able to tolerate philentral feeds, I'm sure is the main cause of mortality. I think a good point of what you just said, Lauren, is that the attempt to make uh, a primary closure is really important. And maybe that's part of the reason that the Saint Justine group in Montreal was so successful. That's very impressive. Uh, for some of us that are old enough to remember when there weren't the preformed silos with uh, springs and them and so forth, it was uh, common practice to close as best as you can. And uh, uh, if you couldn't, you would be uh, fashioning your own silo made from some expensive Dacron or PTFE graft or so forth. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to do that too often anymore, but certainly um, lower resources uh, become some challenges. Uh, Lauren, uh, there's not too much in the uh, questions with regard to QI um, implementation. And I was wondering if you can maybe speak to the aspect in the next uh, less than two minutes that we have left as to how do people uh, move forward with creating these projects uh, at their home institution? Well, I think having a systematic review like was just presented is a huge initial stepping point to be able to go to your stakeholders in the NICU, maybe your partners who might be a little bit skeptical of like, do protocols really work? I mean, we just heard that they do, you know, they re reduce TPN, they reduce ventilator days, they reduce length of stay, all of these things. Um, so I think that's a, a great place to start, just present the data. And then the next step is to actually go to the toolkit and you'll have what you need to bring the data into action in your institution. And you'll have context because you inevitably come up against obstacles and naysayers and you can talk to people who've actually done it successfully because we have a pretty small close-knit community. So chances are everybody who's watching this knows somebody who knows somebody who's, who's actually done this at their own institution. And that's what I found most helpful is those conversations and the actual raw materials. You don't have to reinvent the wheel when you're starting at your own institution. That's great. Well, we're running out of time. I wanted to thank everyone with regard to our panelists, as well as everyone on the 
uh, chat session and Q&A session. I know we didn't get to everyone's questions and, and comments, but please reach out to uh, the panelists directly or uh, more specifically, go to the QSC uh, toolkit and look at the information, download it, contact those local implementers. They really want to hear from you. They are passionate about the work they did and uh, really want to be able to share it. Um, as well as contribute your own. So thank everyone. And then and we're, now we're gonna go to the uh, quality um, and safety awards session um, led by uh, Dr. Uh, Ravel and uh, uh, Derek Wakeman. Thank you everyone. That was a really great discussion about a really complicated topic. Um, I definitely learned a lot and um, the APSA quality toolkit seems like a really great resource for us as well. Yeah, just a pitch for everyone to upload their data to the QSC toolkit. Yep, well, now it's time to scroll down to the bottom of your screen again and take a look at the click here to join the next session, which will be the quality and safety abstract finalists.